Jean Chen wants to show the appeal of nicely with errors to deal. Seeing Rust C's example, there really are ample suggestions you really should steal. <laughs> oh man, those are great. Uh, all right, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk uh, titled The Anatomy of Rust Error Messages. So again, uh, I know they gave a little bit of a recap for me, but uh, just to kind of reiterate a little, a little bit about me, uh, I teach computer science for my day job uh, over Zoom. Uh, so uh, I guess I do this kind of thing a lot. But anyways, uh, shameless plug, I also produce a podcast called The Humans of uh, Open Source, um, where I talk to people who work in open source software. I talk to a lot of people who express, express especially who work in Rust open source. So if you're interested in kind of hearing any of those discussions, uh, shameless plug for my podcast. And then uh, the last piece of kind of relevant information here is uh, I co-shepherd the Rust error handling working group, uh, where we basically work to kind of lobby and advocate for improving Rust's error handling ecosystem. And this last role was kind of uh, what helped to pose, pose this question for me specifically with, uh, well, this question of like, you know, how are Rust's error messages so helpful, right? For me, especially, uh, I don't think I would have stuck with Rust as long as I have without Rust's error messages being as kind of helpful and straightforward and unintimidating uh, as they are. So I think really these are, Rust's error messages are one of the, I suppose one of its killer features, even though sometimes I also think they're a little bit, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They're just not given as much credit as, uh, as usual, or they're just not in the limelight as much, I suppose. And if I had to go ahead and kind of rank different programming languages kind of on a tier list of the quality of their error messages, I'd probably go ahead and do it something like this, where I would put Rust in S tier. Uh, and I think kind of the only other language that I would also say is kind of in the same class would be Elm. Because uh, I know Elm also, uh, the community there also cares a lot about uh, having their error messages be really helpful and, and unintimidating. And then kind of everything else going down. Uh, something like this. By the way, uh, this is just my opinion. And uh, I will also say one thing that I think I've gotten a lot of practice with teaching over Zoom every day is uh, I've gotten really good at imagining that my audience always laughs at my jokes. So uh, that being all said, the norm here with error messages so here's an example of like a, a C++ error message. But kind of the, the norm with error messages for developers, for programmers is like, there, there's something that we have to decipher, right? Like we have to kind of figure out how to read them. I think a lot of us have gotten pretty good or have, I've gotten a lot of practice with running this kind of internal algorithm in our heads whenever we're encountering an error message, right? We have some set of steps that we follow to be like, okay, I have to decipher what this is actually saying. Um, this is a little bit of a, of a, I suppose, an egregious example, but you know, it's not just C++, you see this in lots of other languages as well. Like here's a Python example. It's, you know, it doesn't exactly tell you uh, straight up what the problem is, right? Again, you kind of have to look at this and try to figure out what the interpreter is telling you. Um, and then of course, uh, in JavaScript, I just wanted to bring this one up in particular because you get the infamous undefined is not a function error message that is so unhelpful. Um, right, so, so the norm with a lot of error messages and a lot of different programming language ecosystems is just like, they're, they're, they leave a lot to be desired, right? Um, and again, as programmers, we have to kind of learn to decipher them. And especially for me, as someone who teaches neophyte programmers, you know, like 
error messages are very intimidating for newcomers, for people trying to get into programming for the first time. And especially even for me, I can remember when I first started to learn programming, which was in JavaScript. So that was kind of like my first language that I really tried to learn. Uh, but when an error message popped up, like I was just so intimidated that I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even read it. Right. I was just kind of like that overwhelmed by every time I saw an error message and I'd actually just go and like poke someone who I thought knew what they were doing and ask them like, Hey, can you like decipher this for me? Cause I'm too scared to read it. Um, all this to say though, it's not like you have perfect error messages in Rust, right? Here's a, here's a Rust example. That's also a little bit obtuse. I would say also leaves something to be desired. Um, so obviously there's still work to be done in the Rust ecosystem around Rust error messages, even in Rust C. So, um, but that being said, I think most of the time you're gonna get something a little bit more sane, uh, a little bit more straightforward, hopefully a little bit less uh, intimidating where, you know, you, uh, where it's very straightforward, right? And it paints a lot of helpful ASCII art to tell you, hey, this is the offending line, this is the location. Uh, here's what I, Rusty, think is wrong. And usually there's a helpful hint to also tell you this might be a good suggested fix. So the question that I kind of wanted to pose during this talk is, this, this delta between the best in class error messages and kind of everyone else, I suppose, is, is this like, is this a result of, of culture within those ecosystems or is it a question of technology? And I guess what I mean by that is, is there just some crazy kind of like architecture or technology or algorithmic trick that is going on in like the Rust compiler that makes these error messages possible or makes them easier to be, you know, created when something goes wrong in the compilation process uh, inside of Rust C. Uh, so if you kind of buy this, this dichotomy that I'm presenting, uh, the nice thing from there is we can kind of go ahead and do a little bit of spelunking inside of Rust C to kind of uncover by process of el elimination, like, is this a question of technology or is it a question of culture? So uh, to start off, if we can kind of distill down uh, error messages into kind of this nice standard format where uh, up at the top here, you can see uh, is what's called the level where it tells you, is this an error or it could be a warning or it could be a lint, for example. Uh, you have the error code, which is, uh, you might hear it called like the error index. So there's this, like this nice error index documentation. Um, kind of classifying uh, the error by this index. So you can go ahead and like take this error code if Rusty gives it to you. It doesn't give you an error code for every single error message, but for the ones that it does give you, you can go ahead and take that and basically look that up inside of the error index to get some more context, some more information on this type of error that you're seeing. And then of course you have the main error message, the location, the code in question, uh, all the nice ASCII art that's pointing straight at the code in question. Um, and then notes, as well as any sub diagnostics uh, to try to be helpful and provide you with a little bit more context as to what, uh, what the error is in your code. So there's this nice kind of standard format and kind of the, the, the type or the structure that deals with this at the end of the day inside of Rust C itself is um, this diagnostic type. And so again, we can see there's like a nice kind of one-to-one -one mapping of everything we just saw in that kind of standard error message format. Um, so, uh, the way error messages are kind of surfaced in Rust C, well, first off, we have to talk a little bit real quick about, uh, how Rust C even compiles your code and actually runs it. So there's actually multiple phases to when the Rust compiler is running your code. But first off is the parsing phase. It takes your source code and needs to go ahead and parse that into some internal representation. Uh, so that's called the parsing phase. And uh, there are certain types of errors that are caught within the parsing phase. So we can go ahead and look at an example like this. 
uh, just trying to go ahead and collect some numbers into a vector of unsigned 32-bit integers. And if you stare at this code hard enough, you might realize, oh, we're, uh, we need a turbo fish, or basically we didn't uh, correctly write the, the turbo fish in this case. So when we're going ahead and collecting, uh, and we use a turbo fish to denote what kind of collection we want to collect into, we would use a turbo fish to denote that. And in this case, we just didn't use the correct syntax. And Rust C uh, tells us, hey, you forgot the, the turbo fish. Uh, my suggestion is to go ahead and add those. Um, right, so at the end of the day, inside of the Rust compiler, there is functionality that specifically looks for this case and determines that if this is the case, spits out this error message and determines that that is the most relevant error message to fix the code that you're trying to run. And uh, specifically in the case of this error message, again, it happens during the parsing phase. Uh, and if we were to kind of follow that trail down into Rust-C, uh, we can see that inside of this function that happens again during parsing, this parse dot suffix function uh, down here, we can see uh, this function here that's called check turbofish missing angle brackets. So A plus naming there on the function. And uh, here is the actual body of the function itself. And it's basically uh, checking, it basically tries to, uh, what it tries to do it is actually it, it assumes whatever is after the two colons of, co of the collect. It actually tries to parse that as a valid statement. And if it sees that that is actually uh, a correct expression or an expression that makes sense, then it will go ahead and surface the error of, oh, this makes sense to me if I put in angle brackets. So that's what the problem is. You didn't put angle brackets in. So I'm going to go ahead and suggest that you put those in. Uh, it also, this function also will specifically check for uh, a extra leading angle, angle bracket. Uh, but interestingly, it won't check for if you have an extra trailing angle bracket. That actually then surfaces a different uh, error message altogether. Uh, so this is just kind of like one example of a type of error that surfaced during parsing. And uh, the thing with when you're actually going ahead and parsing, there's this one data structure that is responsible for the entire parsing phase, which is called the parse session here. Uh, and so we can see kind of up here at this type, at the top of this type here, uh, this span diagnostic is what is kind of responsible for holding on to all of the different uh, error messages or diagnostics, I should say, that crop up uh, during the parsing session specifically. Uh, other sorts of error messages that can crop up, so I, or I should say uh, different phases of the compilation process where, of course, other errors, other sorts of error messages can crop up, right? Of course, you have um, one example here that we'll look at, uh, mutability, right? So there's a separate phase after parsing when Rusty is running through your code that specifically checks for mutability. So this actually happens during... Uh, the phase where Rusty is kind of like validating the borrow checker rules. Uh, I'm not really sure why it makes sense that mutability is checked when it's checking the borrow checking rules, but uh, that's how it works. So uh, with something like this, um, we go ahead and initialize a string and then we go ahead and try to insert or basically mutate that string. Uh, but we forgot to of course, to note that the string is supposed to be mutable. So we forgot the mute keyword here. So then in this case, uh, that's exactly what Rusty tells us. So again, there is, of course, a function inside of Rusty that specifically handles this, uh, this error class. And we can find that function here called report mutability error. And again, this happens during the borrow checking phase. And uh, I definitely could not take a screenshot of the entirety of this function, it was something like 434 lines of code. Um, so it was pretty big. But of course, during the borrow checking phase as well, it also checks for lifetimes and uh, wants to ensure that, you know, you, you don't have dangling references. Uh, 
uh, and all that good stuff that the borrow checker is, is of course famous for. And so an example like this, where we're going ahead and trying to uh, push a couple of references to some vector, uh, but doing that inside of a closure where we go ahead and create those references and then pushing those references to this vector outside of our closure, uh, that's gonna go ahead and yell at us for saying, hey, these references don't live long enough because they get dropped at the end of this closure. And then this particular class of error then is handled by uh, this function, again, with a plus naming called report borrowed value does not live long enough. And uh, so these two errors that we just looked at, again, they happen during the borrow checking phase, uh, which at the end of the day is kind of governed by this borrow checker context struct, which again, is pretty big, but we can see down here, uh, this errors buffer where it's basically holding on to all of the diagnostics that are created during this particular phase. Um, so to step back a little bit and try to make sense of all of these different errors or uh, different ways in which diagnostics are surfaced, uh, when I was doing research for this talk, one thing that kind of kept, one word that kept kind of cropping up into my head while I was looking through all of this stuff and, and having fun digging through Rust C, but the thing that, again, cropped up in my mind, the word that I would kind of attribute all of this to uh, is eagerness. And so what I mean by that is, uh, well, both, we can look at this both in kind of the programming context as well as the more general context of what eagerness means, right? So if we think of eagerness in just a programming context, right, that's kind of like the opposite of laziness, which is to say every chance we get to go ahead and do a thing, we're gonna do it versus laziness being on the opposite end of the spectrum where we're only going to do a thing at the last minute when we can no longer get away with not doing it anymore, right? So in the programming context, uh, eagerness is kind of showcased when diagnostics are constructed in Rust C uh, because it turns out every time something could go wrong, as in some kind of diagnostic can be created to address some error that's happening in the compilation process, Rust C will go ahead and do it. And uh, actually, one of the methods on the diagnostic class is this cancel method. And so what's actually going on is it's basically any chance it gets to start creating a diagnostic because it thinks something might be going wrong during the compilation process, it'll go ahead and do it. And then at the end of the day, right, Rusty only wants to surface the relevant errors. So when it's compiling your code, it might see a bunch of errors that turn out to, no, to uh, not actually be relevant to the error at hand. And so it'll actually go ahead and cancel all of those, right? And so we can then also think of that in the more general sense of what the word eagerness means, which is, well, someone's, you know, wants to help you or someone is eager to lend you their support, right? And, and that's exactly what this makes me think of, right? Uh, and so this goes back to, this speaks to, again, the question that we had coming into this talk, which was, was this culture or technology? This, to me, really speaks about culture. Right, Rust C and the the developers who worked on Rust C, right, they are all in that way eager to help you. They're eager to uh, provide helpful context, provide a helpful errors uh, to make your job, your workflow as a developer easier. Right, like if you're if you have to spend less time thinking about deciphering error messages, that's more time that you can be productive on what you're actually, the code you're actually writing, right? And so at the end of the day, it's, it's, it, it is culture and technology. I think technology takes a little bit of a backseat because really I think at the end of the day, even though all the stuff that we saw when we were just going through all of these code examples, like it is, it is cool and it's, it's probably ingenious in a sense. But at the end of the day, I don't think it is more complex or more crazy or more ingenious than anything else inside of Rust C at the end of the day. So in my mind, uh, it really is a question of, of culture. Or more specifically, I think the culture of the community is what informs the technology that we have going on in this case.
And it's been really interesting as well, seeing some other research specifically around kind of like culture and error messages and how uh, the two kind of have this feedback loop. So one thing I actually found interesting was uh, a research paper done in 2011 by some researchers who looked at uh, Racket. So they actually, well, I should say they, um, they did a bunch of research on students looking into what is, uh, how, how helpful better error messages are, basically. And again, the takeaway there, no surprise really, but you know, better error messages led to a better learning experience and a smoother learning curve for students, new students getting into programming in this case. Um, and so, you know, this was done in 2011, but I think really the takeaway of this particular uh, research was, well, you know, it's, it's not a question of technology. The technology is all there to actually make it happen. Really, I, I think it is just a question of increasing the priority of, or, or you know, yeah, basically making error messages a higher priority in your language ecosystem at the end of the day. And, and Rust early on definitely made that a priority and made that a very, uh, as a very conscious choice on the part of the early Rust core developers. Um, to go ahead and look at some other languages, uh, here's a blog post that the creator of Elm uh, again, kind of the other programming language that I would consider to have uh, S tier error messages. Uh, so Evan wrote a very uh, thorough and, and useful blog post specifically on the same thing, but kind of, again, in a rough, in, a, in Elm context. And the thing that I found really interesting from this particular blog post is that he says, I recently took a couple of weeks to really focus on this, this being improving the error messages in, in Elm. And so, you know, he took a couple of weeks, which is to say like it, like, yeah, it is a time investment, but it wasn't like an exorbitant time investment. And, uh, you know, really sat down and deliberately thought about how can we make error messages in, in Elm, you know, really, really good, really helpful. If you've never seen an Elm error message before, it is uh, in format pretty similar, I would say, to, to Rust's error messages. They have ASCII art in there as well, and they color code uh, the error messages. Again, to just really make it as straightforward and unintimidating as possible, really, right? And that's, at the end of the day, uh, doing that really helps uh, new people trying to get into your language. But at the same time, it's also, I would say, really useful for uh, even seasoned developers working in your language, right? Because again, it just like lowers that overhead, that mental overhead uh, of when you encounter an error message, you don't have to go through all of the, that mental algorithm to go ahead and decipher what that error message is saying. It's kind of just right there and you can just kind of address it and go on with your day. And it's, you know, super great. Makes for a much better workflow, I think. Um, some other languages, I'll also quickly mention like uh, Swift and also TypeScript. Um, these languages are doing some interesting things as well. Uh, they're, I would say, taking a slightly different approach, but that's mostly because Swift and TypeScript both have really uh, nice integrations with IDEs. So, you know, uh, Swift with uh, Xcode and TypeScript with VS Code, there's some really cool IDE stuff that they can do there. So that's kind of another really nice and streamlined way to surface error messages. So I think, uh, I think I've ranked these in, in the A tier in my, uh, in my tier list. And I think, you know, these two languages in particular are uh, doing, I would say they also have, have kind of embraced this, um, this notion of improving the culture around error messages and are doing some cool things there as well. But ultimately, you know, I think it would be super great as this culture of just trying to be more helpful to developers, trying to be more helpful to new learners of a programming language as that culture kind of like makes its way into other uh, language ecosystems as well. Hopefully eventually we'll get to a point where we have something that looks more like this. And uh, overall at the end of the day, I think that would be super great for everybody.
And yeah, uh, that's my talk. Uh, hope you found that insightful. And uh, just some references as well, in case. Uh, so like the paper that I talked about is here, as well as uh, Evan's, um, Evan's blog post that I mentioned, as well as the Rusty Dev Guide up at the top. Uh, that was definitely probably the most helpful resource when I was doing research into, into all of this. Great, thank you, Sean. Yeah. Uh, quick question: Is there anything you would change about Rust uh, diagnostics interface? Diagnostics like this with capital D. Um. I I. Th I would say I think at this point with kind of uh, the format that it has it presents in the terminal, right? Like I think that's probably the best you can do there. Uh, some interesting conversations I've had with people who work on this more. Uh, I know they've had some pretty cool ideas, such as like if, hey, if we had better integrations into some kind of IDE, uh, then we'd be able to do some of the things that Swift and type, uh, TypeScript are also doing. So that'd be really cool. I don't know if Rust Analyzer is working on some of that stuff, but that would be great. Um, but yeah, it's been interesting as well seeing uh, if you actually go back and look at some of the earlier pull requests for how to kind of improve Rust's error messages. So like, uh, I, I'm just, I, I was thinking of some names and I'm totally blanking, but anyways, sorry. Um, but yeah, like uh, there have been some pretty interesting ideas uh, that people, contributors to Rust have kind of thought of before for how to go ahead and, and improve error handling or uh, air handling in Rusty specifically, like, um, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't name any off the top of my head right now, but uh, there's been some really interesting ideas there. Some of them, I think, uh, didn't actually end up gaining traction, unfortunately, but, uh, but yeah. What about um, any missing error messages you'd like to see, uh, either in Rusty or Clippy or, or maybe uplifted from Clippy to Rusty, uh, like, for example, the recent uh, C string pointer lint? Um, yeah, that's, that's a little bit, that's a little hard for me to say, to be honest, the, the, especially the point about Clippy, because even though I think it would be interesting to kind of like fold Clippy into Rust C, at the same time, I do also know there's this very deliberate, uh, there's this very deliberate thing where, you know, a lot of where, where the philosophy of Rust is just like, we want most things to be in libraries and not folded directly into the standard library right. or folded into the compiler itself. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think, I would think the current way it's done right now with Clippy is probably what adheres to that philosophy the best in right. this case. Right. Do you feel that, um the design decisions of Rust with respect to error lo locality helps the messages compared to, for example, another language like TypeScript? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I would think so. Sorry, cool. I have more to say on that. <laughs> <laughs> and last question. Um, mm -hmm. One second. I had it around here somewhere. If there were one area of improvement uh, when it comes to compiler diagnostics in Rust, uh, what would that be? As far as compiler diagnostics, I think, again, I feel like those are mostly in a pretty good place. And I, and I say that because I know there are, there's concerted effort that continually goes into working on those. I think maybe where it would be a better or a, uh, uh, more helpful would actually be to devote more time and attention to improving error messages in libraries. Um, and so actually some of the stuff that, um, that we do on the, the, the Rust error handling working group is kind of more targeting that specifically, like uh, disseminating this culture of improving error messages to, to outside Rust C. Because again, I think even though this was this a, a really cool kind of spelunking tour, for the most part, I think I don't worry too much about the state of error handling in Rusty itself. I think, you know, again, people really care about that in the core team. And so I think that's, 
uh, probably in as good a spot as it's going to get. Cool. All right, then. Thank you so much for your talk and your answers. Uh, My pleasure. It was really interesting. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so it's much. Right. And uh, yeah, thanks so much to everyone who put on this wonderful conference and uh, giving me the opportunity to give this talk. It was great. All right.